Welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 384. Talking today about presidential war powers. This is a subject I've written a little bit about and I've talked about. Of course, I had the famous, uh, now famous, exchange with Mark Levin on this subject, and I will link to that whole exchange on the show notes page for today, tomwoods.com slash 383. That was a few years ago. He was defending President Obama, interestingly enough, saying that he had every right to go into Libya or whatever the heck it was at the time without consulting Congress, and I challenged him to defend this, and it went back and forth, and he refused to link to my responses. I, gee, I wonder why. Whereas I linked to all his responses. I don't care if people see those. So that's all actually at TomWoods.com slash Levin. I will, I'll link to that at TomWoods.com slash 383. But today's guest is Lou Fisher. And this is actually an interview I did with Lou Fisher back uh, when I was hosting the Peter Schiff show. I don't actually remember when, but sometime not too terribly long ago. And... I, I had him on because he's the guy I've learned so much from. He's the author of a book called Presidential War Power. I will also link to that at tomwoods.com slash 383. I'm also going to link to my question and answer format uh, essay on presidential war powers, where I respond to a lot of the typical objections to my position, which is that the president uh, does not have the war powers, the inherent war powers that are traditionally uh, associated with the presidency, or at least have been for over half a century now. So I will link to that also at tomwoods.com 383. So in other words, if you really want to get the most out of this episode, then please visit tomwoods.com 383. So you will learn more about Lou Fisher in just a moment when you hear me introduce him. Here we go. And we are back on the Peter Schiff Show. Tom Woods in for Peter. And right now we have a dis distinct pleasure, and it's particularly a pleasure of mine because I've learned so much from this gentleman over the years and admired him from a scholarly standpoint. And to have him as a guest is just a great privilege, and I didn't know we were going to be able to work it out, and, and here he is. Uh, Louis Fisher, a scholar in residence at the Constitution Project, has taught at many universities, testified uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of times before Congress. His many books include, most importantly, in my opinion, from the point of view of the work that I've been doing, presidential war power. And a lot of people have thought of me as being some kind of authority on presidential war power, but I would be more like the shadow, and Lou, Lou Fisher would be like the platonic form when it comes to the study of, of this stuff. So, Lou Fisher, it's my real pleasure and honor to welcome you to the Peter Schiff Show today. Thank you so very much. That's the first time I've ever been called a platonic form. This <laughs> has a, a new role for me. <laughs> I think it's the first time I've used that analogy. All right, let's jump right in now. Before you came on, I played the segments, uh, which probably you've heard by now, of, yes. uh, of Leon Panetta talking to uh, Senator Sessions. Right. So let's start there. I mean, we can talk about Libya in just a minute, but let's start there. He was claiming uh, two basic things. Uh, num number one is... It was without in some, saying it in so many words, he was in effect saying we can, we might consult you after the fact if we feel like doing it, but we don't feel compelled to do it. Number one, and secondly, what really matters is that we get some kind of international recognition of what we're doing. Can you take those one at a time for us? Take all the time you need explaining what's wrong with that. Well, I think what Panetta is doing is got started with President Truman. He was the first president to circumvent Congress. This is uh, June 1950. He circumvented Congress. He went to the U.N. Security Council for, quote, authority. Uh, the Security Council passed two resolutions. So that is the first time in our history, after 160 or so years, where a president would totally uh, walk around Congress and go to some outside body, and that's basically what Secretary Panetta is saying here, maybe not the Security Council, but our NATO allies. And um, after uh, Truman did that in 1950, which was actually against the law uh, in 1945 when the Senate passed the UN um, Charter, uh, the United States had to decide how it was going to participate. And the, the UN Participation Act that year in Section 6 made very clear that any time a president use military force in the U.N. It had to come first to Congress to get authority. So five years later, Truman violated that law and the constitutional independence. And other presidents have done it as well. Um, 
The first Bush in 1990 went to the Security Council in November to get, quote, authority to go to war against Iraq. He, there was a statute passed in January 1991, so that's another example. And then Clinton several times went to either the Security Council to use military force, as in Haiti and in Bosnia. And when he couldn't get in Kosovo from the UN, then he went to NATO allies. So we have, and of course, uh, President Obama going to uh, military operations against Libya, first going to the Security Council and later going to NATO. So you can see that pattern. And regrettably, Congress doesn't understand either appreciate its institutional and constitutional role or something is going on. It's really uh, uh, been so passive and... Um, as you know, once the president does something and gets away with it, they'll do it again and again until something stops it. But Congress says it yet uh, hasn't been the one that should protect itself, but it's not. Now, what do you say to the comeback, though, that once in a while, when proponents of this view even deign to acknowledge our arguments, they'll come back with, well, you know, in the last resort, Congress because it holds the purse strings. Congress can just withhold funds for any operation it doesn't want. So this is a whole lot of caterwauling about nothing. If they really felt strongly, they could just withhold the funds, and that would be the end of it. You don't have to argue about war powers anymore. What do we say to that? Well, I would say the same thing. Uh, once you take that attitude that the president can do what he likes, and then Congress can always come later and stop him, either cutting off money or doing something else, then, if, if that's your theory of government, then I think any president, instead of coming to Congress for uh, legislation, say, on uh, Affordable Care Act, you know, just do it by executive order or some proclamation. And if Congress doesn't like it, then Congress can pass statute to repeal it, and I guess that's subject to a veto, and then you need a two-thirds in each house. So I think the Constitution is set up when you make policy, whether domestic or national security, the authority comes from Congress, and the initiative does not come from the president putting pressure on the Congress whether it wants to stop the president. So I think it has the Constitution upside down. Now, talk to us a little bit about the War Powers Resolution of, of 1973, because it's very interesting. I read an article you wrote. It might have been Presidential Studies Quarterly. I don't remember which one, but uh, that you may have co-authored on this issue, because you're calling for repealing it because it gives the, the president too much power, whereas somebody like Newt Gingrich wants to repeal it because he thinks it curtails the president's power. Is, it, is there a disconnect here? Is there something incoherent in the resolution itself that could lead to such divergent views of it? Well, I think the War Powers Resolution of 1973 is an extremely dishonest statute. And the reason I say that Congress, particularly with the Vietnam War escalating, felt it had been left behind and was under pressure to, quote, reassert itself. And the Senate bill um, did do that, very narrow exceptions for what a president could do unilaterally. Otherwise, they had to come to Congress. The House never felt like you could, by statute, do anything in this area. So when the House and the Senate got the conference committee, they came up with a bill that Senator Tom Eagleton called a bastard, namely, it came out with a little bit of the Senate, a little bit of the House, but it's incoherent. And the reason I say it's incoherent is that the first part of the statute says this bill is in keeping with the intent of the framers. That's one uh, objective. Um, secondly, uh, this will ensure collective judgment. And then when you look at the statute, it doesn't do either one, because it allows the president to use military force for up to 60, 90 days. That has nothing to do with the intent of the framers, and certainly has nothing to do with collective judgment. So it's an extremely uh, dishonest statute, pretending to be assertive, and in fact giving away power that the framers would have been aghast at Congress uh, authorizing presidential wars. But you're right, people look at it as either uh, Congress giving it away too much or, or the people who say it, it, it uh, trenches upon presidential power are those who believe that the president somehow uh, can go to war whenever he wants to. But as I mentioned early, uh, that was never the case. From 1789 up to 1950, every president 
came to Congress either for a declaration or for an authorization. Now, what do you say to the comeback that uh, this is a whole lot of nonsense because we can find, quote-unquote, hundreds of times, you've heard the hundreds of yeah, times sure. argument, probably hundreds sure. of times. Yeah. Hundreds of times presidents deployed troops for this or that purpose without consulting Congress. Well, the, the example is sort of chasing bandits over the border into Mexico. But any actually going to war against another country, using military force against another country, every one that you can think of, uh, the first was an authorized war against France in 1798. 1812 was a declared war. Mexico a declared war. Spanish-American declared war. World War One, World War Two declared war. Vietnam, an authorized war. The first uh, Iraq war authorized. And uh, in 19... Uh, October 20, uh, 2002, uh, authorized war against Iraq, and the year before, authorized war against Afghanistan. So every time you use military force, it's always been either authorization or declaration. Now you do have Libya as a big example of never coming to Congress, and, and certainly uh, Clinton, uh, war against Kosovo, never coming to Congress. So there are some examples, but certainly less than... Uh, a dozen, maybe six at the most. Do, do you think that uh, authorization... I mean, uh, my understanding was that when you have a, a limited engagement, like, for example, the quasi-war with France, just some naval skirmishes, that some sort of congressional authorization is sufficient, but that when you're talking about going all-out war against a country, then nothing short of a declaration of war would be acceptable. And yet in the Iraq thing, it does seem like there was a uh, there was uh, the Congress in effect saying that if 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 the president decides that uh, he we need to go to war with this country then uh, you know he can go ahead and do that. Is there a problem with that constitutionally? Um, it is true that some people say that a declaration of war means that you're using all your capacity in the in the country uh, to act against another. Uh, but I don't think that's the case. Um, Vietnam was one of the biggest wars we've ever had, uh, 500,000 troops, and that was uh, authorized by the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in August 1964. I think what the Quasi War was in 1798, I think they used the word Quasi not just because it was un not declared, but it was a naval war. Uh, there was no authority to go on land. So I think that's the notion of the, of the Quasi War, and it could have been done. Uh, actually, the Supreme Court in 1800 and 1801 both times said it's up to Congress. It can either authorize or declare. And the framers knew that uh, formal declarations were going out of style. Uh, countries were not uh, using declaration. They were using authorization. So I think they're equivalent. Constitutionally, you can either uh, declare or authorize. Okay, we're joined by Lewis Fisher, author of Presidential War Power, a very important book. And when we come back from this break... I want to ask him about the comment that the caller made that the Constitution was written by people who couldn't anticipate some of the foreign policy challenges we face now. How do we respond to that? Are right, you listening to the Peter Schiff Show, everybody, the gold standard in talk radio? Don't go away. The Peter Schiff Show. To President Obama, Secretary Geithner, Madame Pelosi, and all of the socialist econ professors across America. We're sorry. We're sorry. Peter Schiff is back on the air. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Peter Schiff Show. I'm Tom Woods in for Peter, joined by Lou Fisher, author of Presidential War Power, among many other works. And we're just talking about well, what we always talk about in this situation, which is, uh, once again, we have presidents who uh, are not paying attention to the Constitution. And I guess it just leaves you wondering, is there anything that can be done? Uh, is, is there any wording that could restrain an ambitious leader? I mean, is, was there any wording that could have stopped a, a, a Caesar? I mean, are we ultimately faced with the fact that constitutions are just pieces of paper, and we, the people, are basically helpless to enforce them, and we just have to sit back and take it when the presidents do this. Is, is that where we are? I hope not. Uh, the framers uh, 
uh, rejected uh, monarchy. They rejected putting all of external affairs, foreign affairs, and war powers in the executive. That was the British model. Uh, and it was all very, very clear. And you can look at a lot of the foreign affairs powers and war powers that had been given to the king are in Article One for Congress. So that model lasted uh, from 1789 to 1950, when Truman went to war in Korea using the UN. So I think what has destabilized the Constitution is these uh, misapplied uh, institutions. Uh, the UN was never supposed to be a substitute uh, for Congress. The UN Participation Act of 1945 makes that clear. NATO was never supposed to be a substitute for Congress. But uh, presidents after 1950 um, used that, and Congress didn't protect itself. Now, the framers expected all three branches to protect themselves, to fight off encroachments. That would keep the separation of powers alive and well. But Congress, uh, from World War II on, has not protected itself. And it's not just not protecting itself. It's not protecting the constituents who send them here. It's not protecting democratic government. So that's... Um, presidents will... To, uh, either Democrats or Republicans will get by with whatever they can. And it's, it's up for Congress to have some institutional people there. I think there's been a huge decline. I, I worked for Congress from 1970 to... Uh, for 40 years uh, till August 2010, I certainly worked with many, many people who understood the institution and, and were willing to uh, dedicate it to protect it. There are very few today, uh, very, very few. That's, that's the problem we have. And unless members protect their institution, uh, we'll continue on the road we're on. Now, what do you say to people uh, like the one I described before we went into the break uh, who say that well, these days things have changed. We've got all kinds of uh, different threats, uh, very different from ones that the framers could have anticipated. So, of course, we have to allow some kind of elastic interpretation of the president's war powers. If, if Otherwise, it would just be unreasonable. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, the framers fought in the Revolutionary War. They know all about that, and they, they, they did not adopt the British model, which is what the, the caller uh, would, would want to do, go back to the British model of putting all external affairs in, in the president. Um, you know, there are parts of the Constitution that make it very clear that the framers understood dangers. For example, they gave Congress the authority to provide for calling forth a militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. And also in Article 1, you cannot suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, uh, unless in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. So the framers knew all about, about emergency power. Uh, certainly the huge emergency, which would have been phenomenal, was 9-11. And yet, uh, about a week after 9-11, um, President Bush came to Congress and he got authorization, the Authorization for Use of Military Force, AUMF. So even in the greatest emergency we've had after World War II, um, the smart thing to do constitutionally and politically is for the two branches to work through statutory authority, not to have the president go off half-cocked. That would be the dumbest thing to do. So um, whether it's an emergency or not, the um, president comes to Congress President Bush would have been much better had he come to Congress after 9-11 and gotten authority for military commissions instead of doing that unilaterally. That just was a calamity for the next six, eight years. We've never gotten over that unilateral action. So come to Congress, get authority, and you're on the right footing, both legally and politically. Now, my sense of the authorization for the use of military force was that it would be, it, it was analogous to the types of things that we saw that Congress did authorizing Adams to use force in, in limited circumstances, authorizing the, the Barbary pirates uh, activities, and that it, it was aimed at, all right, well, these are the guilty parties, let's go out and get them. But I, I, my interpretation was I would have viewed it as an abuse to take the AUMF and justify it also as use it as a justification for a full-scale invasion of a whole country. I mean, it, it did seem like in the AUMF that we're going to pinpoint who the perpetrators are, we're going to go after them, 
my view is that the AUMF was clearly, you would have to go beyond that to justify the, the full-fledged invasion of, of a whole country. But you disagree with me on that? No, I, I agree with what you said. And in fact, it's, uh, once you decide that al-Qaeda is in Afghanistan, you have that as the, the, the country you're going to go into, then, of course, al-Qaeda can go to Somalia, Yemen, any other place it wants to. So now it's not one country, it's uh, as many countries as al-Qaeda wants to go to. So you're right. I think what you said earlier about President John Adams, the, the uh, country was France and Mexico. Later, we've always gone against uh, one country, or, or World War II was certainly several countries. But uh, 9-11 is certainly totally new territory. It just looks like as many countries are available as al-Qaeda wants to go to. But we've got about just, just a minute left. On on this issue in uh, in, in the the war powers resolution they they they'll use words that are very important to, to define like w when war or hostilities but then the question and, and when war exists then these congressional so-called limitations come into effect but it seems to me the issue is who defines when something constitutes a war in the first place no it's a perfect example to end because uh, as you know in libya the administration obama administration not only said there's no war there there's not even hostilities and the reason they said that because we don't have any casualties so that means that any powerful nation could pulverize another country and if there are no casualties by the aggressor then there's no war and no hostilities that's just playing games with words incredible kind of logic and that, that's the tricky part about trying to tie these people up with words, because they're so, they're so skilled at navigating their way out. Uh, Lou Fisher, thanks so much for taking some time with us. Uh, pleasure. A, a pleasure talking to you. And that's the show for today. Remember, TomWoods.com slash 383 is where you can find resources related to this episode. That's another week for you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. The Tom Woods Show.